I'd like to welcome you tonight to our live stream from Martyrs, uh, from the Jubilee Complex on the third in the series on basic Bible study. We trust so far it has been reasonably basic, although I know there was a lot of material going your way in terms of geography uh, this time last week. Uh, tonight we come to look at the Old Testament timeline, and so we're looking at the Back to lesson one, really, where you're thinking about the first 17 books that were the books of history, and seeing how they tell from beginning right through to the end of number 17, they tell the unbroken story of Old Testament history. So that's where we're looking tonight. We're turning to God's Word to begin with, and it's Psalm 106. The psalmist here gives a little bit of an overview of part of the nation's history, and we'll read part of Psalm 106 tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, hopefully, you'll stay there, and uh, as well that you have your, your notes all printed out or up on screen ready to be edited and all that kind of thing. But you're very welcome. Thank you for your support. Psalm 106, and the verse 1. It's actually a psalm of national lament, and it could be classified a historical psalm. And so we are looking here at a little review of the nation's history. Praise ye the Lord, who give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all His praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with mine inheritance." We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up, so he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies, there was not one of them left. Then believed they his words, they sang his praise, they soon forgot his works, they waited not for his counsel but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness, and tempted God in the desert. And He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. They envied Moses also in the camp, and Aaron the saint of the Lord. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan, and covered the company of Abiram, and a fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb, and worshipped the molten image. Thus they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Amen. We know the Lord will add His blessing onto the reading of His Word. And even in what we've read here tonight, this part of the psalm that we've looked at, well, you can get a little clue as to reasons for what happened in history. Why, in other words, and this is the question, did God save Israel as they approached the Red Sea? Well, you don't really get the answer in Exodus. But you do get it here in Psalm 106 and the verse 8, Nevertheless, He saved them for His name's sake, that He might make His mighty power to be known. 
And that's the only reason God saves any of us, for His name's sake. For nothing good have I, were by Thy grace to claim. I lay my burden down at the feet of Calvary's Lamb, knowing Jesus, He paid it all. So all to Him I owe. We'll bow together in prayer, and then we'll proceed into our Bible study tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this opportunity again restored to us of opening up Thy Word and of going down a particular line of study that we trust will be a blessing to our heart, a guide to our way, and will produce the kind of understanding of Thy Word within us that will remind us Well, here's why God gave the Word. Here's how He would have us understand it. This is it going down the timeline in the Old Testament. And as we go down this particular route, we pray that we will know blessing. We pray that we will know counsel. We ask, Lord, that Thou wilt open up the Bible to our understanding and our understanding to Thy Word on a daily basis. We're coming tonight, and as we think of the overall timeline, we're conscious that we'll have a little venture into looking at Adam and looking at Eve. And we can't even mention that name tonight without remembering the tragic events of last evening and the loss of our brother Matthew Arnold. And we pray for his wife, Kira. We pray for his little daughter, virtually just born, a couple of weeks and more, Eve. Lord, we pray for the Arnold family connection, for the Beatties tonight, that Thy mercy will be rich and real towards them. We cannot conceive the heartbreak. We cannot, Lord, ponder the circumstances. We can't derive any lessons from it. We must Come to the Lord and cast all our care upon Him and discover afresh, and really, He careth for you. Lord, come and speak words of comfort that are way beyond the expression that we humans can muster and give added grace. For those who have been taken by the COVID-19 virus, And we think of the brother-in-law of Reverend Alan Smiley and his wife Vivian. Pray, Lord, that I will be with uh, that man's wife, once a preacher of righteousness, his wife Yvonne, and their children and family. Think of Pastor Jim Wilson and others who have been taken. And Lord, may the comfort of the Holy Ghost be granted by Thy coming alongside to help as the very person Thou art, the Comforter. I will not leave you comfortless, our Savior said. I will come again to you. And so these families we've mentioned, and many others not known to us, we pray with Thy great and inexhaustible comfort that Thou will draw remarkably and richly close. In Jesus' name and to Thine eternal glory, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. So, we're looking tonight at uh, the notes hopefully you have in front of you. That'll be the Old Testament timeline. So, part three in the basic Bible study, this introductory guide to understanding the Bible. It must be the Gurkhas. I mentioned them in a little video that I posted on my birthday just about two weeks ago, because back then I just begun to paint a small detachment of them that I plan to include whenever we can get it up and running in our World War II scenario, and they'll fit into the particular battle that was waged in Italy, the Battle of Monte Cassino. That's where the Gurkhas would have been prominent. And then on the Lord's Day evening after I referenced them, I commenced my message that night by telling the story of a heroic Gurkha soldier, acting sergeant, Diprasad Pun. 
He single-handedly fought off a sustained attack by the Taliban in Helmand province, southern Afghanistan, on the evening of the 17th of September and the year 2010. And then, to keep the connection going, I was thinking about geography, as we all were last week that were tuned in, and also history for this week, and my attention was drawn to a video that appeared on YouTube where a young man was working for Mountain Ram Adventures and promoting a flight out over the Himalayas. It's known as the Everest Experience Flight. It's considered as the most beautiful mountain flight in the world. That's what he said. Then, having claimed that, he explained how it takes in some of the highest peaks of the world. And up in that Himalayan flight, uh, you will be flying over Everest, coming in at 29,000 feet plus, and then there is Lhotse, 27,940 feet, and then you have Makalyum, 27,825 feet, huge mountains in that Himalayan range. The first highest peak on earth, the fourth and the fifth highest, we have mentioned there, and that flight was going over that. Apparently, those who hadn't made it to the Everest base camp, this would be a special treat to them, although we said, you know, even if you've been to the base camp, it would be lovely to get up there and from a height in the sky, look down as to where you had been walking and climbing. Now, I looked at that video, I looked at another one, it was even more spectacular. It was a zoom over those Himalayan peaks, this time not in a little aircraft, but in a helicopter. And suspended, it seemed, as you were drifting and bobbing around over there, the sight was absolutely spectacular. So, you filled in your first blank tonight, which is number one, highest peak in the world as Everest. And the point we're making in telling the story is this. When you're flying over the top of a mountain range, it can be difficult as you're going over the top to determine which down there are the higher mountain peaks. But if you fly over that same mountain range after a light snowfall, since the snow was going to hit and lie on the higher elevations, the highest peaks stand out. They're the ones with snow on them, and so they will be more distinguishable uh, from the others that are there. Now, we've got a little hat appearing in the notes here, and when the hat appears, then we have an important point to make. I'm setting the backdrop here with this particular important exclamation point. As we begin, our examination of the stories of the Old Testament, that's the first 17 books, those that are designated as history, our intention is to follow the helicopter ride or the aeroplane ride, and really only to pause to look at the highest peaks. In other words, the ones with snow on them. So, the ones that stand out. We'll have to leave a lot of the detail further down the mountain slope and right down in the valley and just keep pressing on, missing that out. Otherwise, we would be here all night and we can't be that. Well, you could fall asleep on your sofa. I just don't fancy standing here all that time. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take, first of all, the main periods of Old Testament history, so they're the different eras that were back then. Then we want to link each period of history with the central historic figure of that era. And again, I have to limit myself here and tie it away down to one figure, one prominent figure, high peak in that particular period each time. So, a number of periods, one figure in each period, and then we'll add in the primary locations that were associated with those figures during that time period. And then we'll have a little short storyline, a summary of what happened in their lifetime as they take up their positions in Old Testament history. 
So we'll have these figures, they'll be in various locations, and they will be appearing at certain times along the timeline of our Old Testament history that stretches over these first 17 books. So this storyline, we're going to divide it up in its total, that's across all of the Bible, Old and New Testament, we're going to divide it into 12 major eras. Central figure in each era, main location as well for each era. And the point is, we find nine of the 12 eras in the Old Testament, which means blank that needs to be filled in, you've got with simple maths, just three found in the New Testament. You know all these little mass equations and questions that are going up on Facebook at the moment, and one's passing it to another, and I failed it, or I passed it, and so it goes to somebody else, and you're looking at it. There was a really annoying little guy last week, did you see him, with um, so small, shrunken away down in the final picture, and he had a couple of trainers on that you would need a magnifying glass to see, and it was, you know, all pixelated and whatnot, but there's a pair of trainers on the wee guy, and holding two cones or whatever it was in his hand, chip cones or whatever. That's what it looked like to me. And he was all adding up to a figure. Rather frustrating. But here we go. Nine of the eras in the Old Testament, three found in the New Testament. In this study tonight, we are, as we've been saying, only dealing with the Old Testament. And we're looking at three parts, basically, of a four-part chart. And you'll see the chart as we go on. So, the three parts, the main eras, the central figures, and the main locations. The fourth part is we will add the summary storyline and the New Testament events in later studies. Now, there'll be a little bit of storyline, a very small and short summary tonight, but we'll get there in time. Okay, over the page to page four in our notes, and we are looking at the first main topic tonight, which is the eras. Nine main eras or historical time zones of the Old Testament. If you want to put an A in the margin, capital A, against the nine main eras of the Old Testament, then fire away and do that because you'll see later on we've got a B. And we should have a C, but we don't have a C, and we don't have an A here. So whenever I saw the B in the notes as I was looking over them, I'm thinking, I need to put an A in there. But you can do that now. So A, the nine main eras of the New Testament. Then on to number one. One era out of nine, creation. Bringing in, as you would expect, the creation of the world and also man and early events. Then we've got patriarch, the birth of the Hebrew people through a family of patriarchs, and those patriarchs would have been a father or a leader or a ruler of a family or a tribe, and that's taking us over a period of 200 years. Then we come from creation, patriarch, to exodus. That's the exit point for the Hebrew people when they eventually get away from 400 years of slavery in the land of Egypt. And then out in the wilderness, they received the law, Mount Sinai, they set up the tabernacle, and then they wandered in the wilderness for virtually 40 years out there. So that's creation, patriarch, exodus would be the next era, fourth one, conquest, into the promised land of Canaan they go, led by Joshua, and we have the Hebrew people returning from Egypt into this land of Canaan conquest. Then we come to the fifth period, Judges, and we have 450 years divided among quite a number of judges here, and we're going to, there might be some debate over this, a little bit of controversy, but I'm here, you're there, and so I can't hear you whenever you might be pushing and rooting for somebody else. I know there are a number of viable alternatives, but I've had to select one here tonight, and we'll get to that in time. But Judges… 450 years of them, Israel governed by rulers that are called judges. Then we come to the kingdom period. That's an additional 400 years added on here. And over that time, Israel becomes a fully-fledged nation, ruled by a monarchy. From the creation, patriarch, exodus, conquest, judges, periods, through to the kingdom period, then we come to the exile. That's number seven. 
And you will know that Israel were carried away into captivity. They were there for 70 years, as had been prophesied by many of their warning prophets. And their leaders are living in exile because they've been conquered by foreign powers, Assyria and Babylonia. Then we come to number eight. That's the return. They come back. And those Jews who had been in exile, those who had survived, not all of them came back, but a significant portion of them came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and to put up the temple again. And then the final period in Old Testament history we're calling silence. It lasts for 400 years between the close of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament. And why are we calling it silence? Because there's no record of the prophets operating over this time. God is not inspiring Scripture over this time. It's a period, a long, long period of silence. What would it be like if the Lord were to close up heaven and be silent to you and silent to me? And so, it pops into my head, that little chorus, are you living where God answers prayer? Does He hear us? Is He responding to us? Or are we going through a period in our lives of silence? can be a reality. So, we have these nine main eras of the Old Testament, creation, patriarch, exodus, conquest, judges, kingdom, exile, return, and silence. And just to push the power of repetition, you've got it again if you have your notes in front of you, charting the story of the Old Testament, page 5, era. And the same nine, of course. It'll be a bad job if we change them. Creation, patriarch, exodus, conquest, judges, kingdom, exile, return, silence. Sometimes, of course, I'd be the kind of guy that just would change it or throw in a curved ball just to get you thinking again and jolt the system and stir you up. Wake up there. Nudge that guy that seems to be half asleep beside you. Thank you. So, we have nine eras, and they are the main time periods in the Old Testament. Turn over the page to page eight in the notes, page six rather in the notes, and you will come to the arc of Bible history. And I think this is a very valuable way to remember these nine time periods that we have been talking about up until this point. And you can see inside the ark or arch, uh, you have the numbers corresponding to the rim here, going around the rim, one through to nine, inside the arch, one, creation, two, patriarch, three, exodus, four, conquest, five, judges, six, kingdom, seven, exile, eight, return, nine, silence. You nearly know them by heart already because we've been there uh, several times here already. So, you're ready for the test. Number one, just holding yourself back is your problem here. So, fill in the eras, and uh, it'll be good to cover over uh, all the stuff that we have done so far. Don't refer to it. And in test number one, we're looking here at right in the correct era on the line that matches the description. And you have options here. So, the era, number one, against the description, the creation of the world and man and early events. Well, the clue is in the text here. It's going to be creation is the era. The birth of the Hebrew people through a family of patriarchs. So there we've got it again. So, it's the patriarch. That's what fits in the blank there under era. On to the top of page seven, we have creation, the exodus of the Hebrew people. And of course, creation would be throwing you. That's one of the options. Doesn't tie in there. It's not creation, it's exodus. Exodus you want in there. Then the next description, the conquest of the promised land. Conquest. A 450-year period is the next one. Rulers called judges. So, judges is what you put in the blank over to the middle of the page there. Then the kingdom era, the exile era, the return era, the silence era. We have them, and I'm trusting that even at this early stage tonight, the nine eras in the Old Testament timeline are beginning, beginning to take shape 
in your mind. Look at the symbols on the ark here in page 6, with the world beginning here, and then the guy with the staff, patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you could think there. Then you have the pyramids, so that's got to be Egypt. Uh, then you're into the Exodus period, that would be. You're into the conquest with the cross swords, Joshua and all of that. Then you've got the judges. Then you have the crown for the kings. You've got the chains for captivity or the exile period, and then they're coming back, and they're armed with a lot of materials at the behest of the king of Persia, coming back, returning from exile, number eight and number nine. Ah, scroll, question mark. Who's talking? No voice. And that's the silence period. So, we're on to the second main part of the material we're covering tonight, and that is on page eight, B. There's B. There's no A, but you've put that in, I trust, and there's no C, but when we get to that, we'll point it out. Uh, you'll see when we get to it. B, the nine central figures of the Old Testament. Time to get a key man for each time period. And we have one key person with one exception. So, creation, we have Adam, obviously, the first man. Who else would we choose for that? Patriarch, Abraham, friend of God, the first patriarch. Then in the Exodus period, we have Moses, who led the children of Israel, the Hebrews, in that Exodus time. Then conquest is Joshua, the leader of Israel's army. Judges, here's the one I said could be a little controversial because my inclination might be more Samuel right at the end of the period. But I guess even from our early days in, you know, sitting at mom and dad's knee with Bible story books, Samson was always a favorite story. And so I put in Samson here, who I think is the most famous judge, and most children will uh, relate to that story as well. They will know it. Then we've got the kingdom period. Has to be David, the most successful king of Israel. Into the exile, we have Daniel. We had Ezekiel too, but Daniel would be the major exilic prophet. Then we have the return period. Take your choice between Nehemiah and Ezra. I've chosen Ezra here, the central return leader. And then silence. And you've got a bunch of guys that you probably wouldn't want to break the silence. Our Lord called them generation of vipers and everything else, binding men with burdens that they themselves wouldn't touch with their little finger, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. And so that's what we're using tonight and will be, as we go on, God willing, as the nine central figures tied into each one of these nine different eras in the Old Testament timeline. We're moving now into, well, a preacher would say, I'm going to meander off a little bit. Well, he probably wouldn't tell you that he'd just do it, and you'd be sitting there working at, where is he going, and when is he going to get back? Well, I know I'm meandering off to a degree, but I think it's important that we do it here for Adam and Eve. So, we're turning the spotlight on Adam and Eve, and we're doing it on the basis of we're throwing out a number of questions that people tend to ask. Number one, when were Adam and Eve created? Let me put it like this. If Old Testament history and the ages we have in Genesis chapter 5 are computed, no matter how you add them up, there's only really one good way to do it, isn't there? Adam and Eve were likely created in approximately 4,000 BC, 6,000 or so years ago. The evidence is strong. No matter what people do to try and unpick and untie and stretch them out, the evidence is strong that the Genesis, Genesis genealogies, the family trees, and so such a person lived for so many years, and he died, and the son was, and he lived so many years, and he died, and he gave birth to, um, obviously, through the family tree there that's growing, 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 and all of these developing branches, when you bring them in here, it's closed. God created Adam on day six, approximately 4,000 years before Christ, and there doesn't seem to be any support, and I'm putting it very very mildly here when I put it like this. There doesn't seem to be any support for the notion that there are gaps in the Genesis 
genealogies, I see no evidence of that. So, when were Adam and Eve created? Second question, how many children did Adam and Eve have? Well, we're not told exactly how many, but we do know that they had Cain, Genesis 4 and 1, they had Abel, Genesis 4 and 2. We had as a replacement of Abel, Seth, in Genesis 4, the verse 25. And then Genesis 5 and 4 mentions other sons and daughters of Adam and Eve as well. Now, thinking of their long lifespans, and Adam lived for 930 years, thinking of the command that was given to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, in Genesis 1.28, it seems reasonable to conclude, very reasonable indeed, that they had many sons and daughters. Be fruitful and multiply. Not like the climate change activists and others of the world today who would be trying to get right into everything that we do in our lives, even in terms of the number of children that are produced in a marital relationship. How dare they? It's none of their business. Were Adam and Eve cavemen? Genesis 3 records Adam and Eve having a fully intelligent conversation with God. They were not ape-like or mentally deficient by any stretch of the imagination. They were the product of God's genius and God's grace. They came about by God's goodness, including His good design. Adam and Eve, let me tell you, were the most perfect human beings in world history. Their immediate descendants were also extremely skillful, and you can pick that up. When you begin to read the early chapters in Genesis chapter 4, verse 19 through 22, you'll find just how skillful they were musically, as well as with metalwork, setting up schools of metalwork at that time. Who would have thought it? The Bible records that these folk were not cave dwellers. Then a fourth question, were Adam and Eve the first human pair? Now, let me caution you. The answer to that question has huge implications for the message of the gospel, because the Bible makes it clear only the descendants of Adam can be saved. Adam, who was he? The Bible tells us the first man. It doesn't negotiate. It doesn't fudge. It hits right the nail on the head here. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Adam was the first man. You can't have anybody before the first. God did not start by making a whole group of men. He made one man. Adam, he called him. And then Eve, the first woman. It's recorded in Genesis 3 and 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother. Not a whole host of other people along with her. She was the mother of all living. In other words, all people today are descendants of Adam and Eve. He was the first man. She was the first woman. You see, in Genesis 2 and 20, we're told that Adam looked around at the animals, and there was no mate there. There was nothing of his kind in the animal kingdom that he was looking at. So, God intervenes, and He made from Adam's rib or side the Hebrew word selam. In Genesis 2, 21 to 24, He made a totally unique individual in a totally unique event. Jesus then, in Matthew 19 and Paul, in Ephesians 5, picks up this historical, this one-time event as being the doctrinal foundation for the marriage of one man to one woman. And their message, Christ's message, the apostles' message, the entire message of all of the Bible is so simple and straightforward. At the beginning, check it out, God made Adam and Eve, one man and one woman, and that is how He intended it to stay. Now, all of that makes it obvious that there was only one man, Adam, and one woman, Adam's wife, at the beginning, and there never were any people who were not their descendants 
Paul, preaching in Mars Hill, Acts chapter 17, talks about we're all from one blood. And there is nothing in scientific research. Don't let them browbeat you into thinking otherwise. There is nothing in scientific research that has been able to disprove the existence of Adam and Eve. In fact, you'll see many papers out there even begrudgingly, even reluctantly, because they know where this is going to go and where we're going to take their conclusions to. It began with a human pair. Of course it did. And we know their names. The Bible has told us. Question five. Who was Cain's wife? And some people will ask you this and rub their hands and stand back and, ha, ah, I've got them here. Where do we hear their answer? Because we are going to put them and pin them on a post here and make them the subject of ridicule because we know what they're going to say. Many skeptics, that's why I put the term in, skeptics have claimed that for Cain to find a wife, there must have been other races of people on the earth who were not descendants of Adam and Eve. Well, Genesis 5 and 4 tells us, as we've noted, that Adam and Eve begat sons and daughters. Simple answer to a simple question that is by no means as complicated as some people would like it to be. One of those daughters had to become Cain's wife. Now, many people immediately throw out that conclusion, and they say, well, that's not right. You can't marry your relation." what? Catch on. The truth is anybody who marries, marries a relative. If you don't marry your relation, then you don't marry a human. So, you know, husband, wife, watching in, check out who your partner is. Ask a few salient questions quick. Dear knows who you've picked up there. Seriously. Anybody who marries, a fellow human being marries a relative. All people are descendants of Adam and Eve, all are of one blood. It's not, as they say, rocket science. It's basic. What about God's law in this? Well, provided marriage was, according to His terms, between one man and one woman for life based on what we're taught in Genesis 1 and 2, right at the beginning. Originally, back then, when close relatives, even brothers and sisters, married each other, they did not break God's laws in this. Abraham, you'll find, he married his half-sister. Whenever the pressure came on him, he said, of course, to save his skin, she's my sister. Well, she was his half-sister. Genesis 20, verse 12, and God blessed that union to produce the Hebrew people through Isaac and Jacob. And it wasn't until 400 years later that God gave Moses laws that put a stop to marriages like this. At the beginning, totally lawful. Today, brothers and sisters, half-brothers, half-sisters, etc., are not allowed by law to marry because their children would have an unacceptably high risk of being deformed. But when the first two people were created, they were physically perfect. You see, everything God made was very good. And we see him in Genesis 1.31, the record tells us that after all of creation was complete, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was, here's God's verdict, very good. So back then, for Adam, for Eve, for Cain, for his wife, their genes were perfect. No mistakes. But, and this is where it all changes, when sin entered our world. Because of Adam, Genesis 3 and 6, Romans 5 and 12, God cursed the world so that the perfect creation then began to degenerate. It suffered death. It underwent a process of decay. 
Romans 8 and 22 highlights that over thousands of years, this degeneration has produced all kinds of genetic mistakes in living things. But belonging to the first generation of children ever born, Cain, as well as his brothers and his sisters, would have received virtually no imperfect genes from Adam and Eve. The effects of sin and of the curse would have been minimal, minimal to begin with. And in that situation, God allowed brother and sister to marry without any ill effect on their offspring. This law, as we've mentioned, forbidding marriage between close relatives, wasn't given until the days of Moses, Leviticus chapter 18 through Leviticus chapter 20. And by that stage in human history, degenerative mistakes were building up in the human race to such an extent that it was necessary for God to forbid brother, sister, and close relative marriage. And of course, while there were no dating agencies, I assume. And there certainly was no internet to get hitched up with somebody on the other side of the planet that you're unlikely ever to meet face to face by any other means. There were plenty of people. It wasn't the choice that faced Key in here, one of my sisters or nobody at all. There were plenty of people 400 years down the line in Moses' day so that there was no necessity for close relations to marry. Now, where are we going with this? There are implications for the gospel here. The most important aspect of the topic is this. If we can't demonstrate that all humans can trace their ancestry back to Adam and back to Eve, then the gospel message runs into difficulties. In Romans 5 and 12, we are taught that Adam was our representative. By one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and that death then passed upon all men. Adam was the representative head standing for the race, the federal head, the family head, if you want to put it like that. And when he sinned, the death penalty that he received as judgment for a sin passed down onto his descendants too. He's standing, representing us all, and when he falls, we fall in him. This idea that's often popularized that there were pre-Adamite men, men before Adam, or other human-like creatures in the world unaffected by Adam's sin, that is, theological nonsense. Romans 5 and 18, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. There we have Adam, our representative, tucked away in there, and you have somebody else coming through as well. And thank God for that somebody else. Man's fall meant that Adam and all of his descendants would be separated from God in that sinful state and separated forever. But the good news that comes cascading in is, hey, hold on, there's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. Because a man has brought sin and penalty and death into the world, the descendants of Adam, they need another man another representative, this time one without sin who will not sin. But he also has to be a member of the human race to pay the penalty for man's sin and to take the resulting judgment of death upon himself. Now, where are we going to find this sinless man? Because as Romans 3 and 23 reminds us, every man sins. Well, man would never have found him. God Himself provided the solution. So, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that God provided another Adam, and Christ is known as the last Adam, the eternal Son of God, took a human nature in addition to His full deity. 
Hebrews 2, verse 18 to verse 11 to 18, he became that perfect God-man, the man Christ Jesus. And in his humanity, he was a descendant of Adam. And you can trace his family tree. You can do it in Matthew chapter 1. You can do it in Luke chapter 3. You can trace the family tree right through Noah and Abraham and David and back to Adam. He became, by the virgin birth, our relation. He is called the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, because, because he took the place of the first Adam. And where the first Adam failed, the last Adam succeeded. Christ became the new head, and because He is sinless, He is able to pay the penalty for sinners on that cross by His death and the shedding of His blood. Seven whole centuries before Christ's incarnation, His birth and His death, the prophet Isaiah identified him as the one who would be the kinsman redeemer, one who's related by blood to those that he is going to save, to those whom he will redeem. And you find that in Isaiah 59 and 20, and the same Hebrew word in there, goel, is used to describe Boaz, and how he related to Ruth in that fabulous story in Luke, Ruth 3 and also in Ruth chapter 4. So only, here's the point we're making, only the descendants of the first man, Adam, can be saved by the last Adam. Another question, how long were Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before they sinned? The Bible, again, doesn't explicitly tell us a time frame here. We know that Adam and Eve didn't conceive any children until after the fall, Genesis 4, verse 1 and 2. So it's highly unlikely they were in that garden for very long. Seven, were Adam and Eve saved? Now, the Bible doesn't specifically tell us in so many words Adam and Eve were saved, but we know this. Adam and Eve were the only two human beings who knew about God before they became tainted with sin and fell to the serpent's advance. It's likely they knew God even better and believed Him even more after their sin than any of us do to this very day. God, and here's mercy, right from the off. God continued to talk with Adam and talk with Eve, and He provided for them after their fall. He didn't abandon them. He rescued them. Genesis 3, verse 8 through to 19. Also, we know this. To Adam and Eve was given God's promise that He would provide a Savior. Genesis 3, the verse 15, and Bible teachers understand this offspring of the woman, in Genesis 3.15, to be none other than, hey, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. And just as Eve found hope in God's promised offspring, so we look to God's promised offspring of redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Another thing about Adam and Eve back then, God made garments of skin to cover them over. After they fell, Genesis 3 and verse 21, that meant there was the first animal sacrifice. That's a beautiful picture of the gospel that we'll read about and reread about and keep reading about, and it's the old, old story of Jesus and His love. It'll be our theme even in glory because they sing, worthy the Lamb that was slain to receive honor. And there in the Garden of Eden, they receive this in picture form, the picture of the gospel of substitution. He gave His life for me. That principle was laid down. It was taught clearly, foreshadowing as it did the eventual death of Christ on the cross for sin. So those facts in my mind demonstrate Adam and Eve knew the gospel, knew the God of the gospel, had embraced it, 
Saw it in picture form, knew it in reality, were saved, did go to heaven and paradise when they died. That's been a huge detour. But I feel this is the time to introduce this message when we're mentioning Adam. So, don't turn back. Don't turn over the page. We're on page 15 together. And we have some blanks to fill in. Era, creation, figure, that's Adam. Description, the first. And everybody says it together, man. Of course, patriarch era. Big figure in the patriarch era is Abraham. And he's the first, yeah, patriarch. Exodus, the figure is Moses. He's the leader of the Exodus. Conquest period, we have Joshua, the young warrior, and he is the leader of Israel's. You can't be a warrior unless you have an army. He's the leader of the army. Then we have judges, that period, and Samson we have chosen as the most famous judge. The kingdom era, David is there, the most successful Israelite king. Exile era, Daniel coming to the fore, the major exilic prophet, God's spokesman to a nation that had been carried away into captivity. Then we have returned. They're on the way back. Ezra's a leader there, the central return leader. Then that period, 400 years of its silence, where the Pharisees are beginning to flex their muscles, be forced to be reckoned with the religious leaders. So, test number two, complete. Test number three, and you can do that yourselves. It is pretty easy there. Creation, who is the figure from the list of options over on the right-hand column? Well, we're looking for Adam. That's where we've been. And patriarch, we're looking for Abraham and so on. You will know who fits in there because it's right above you, but try to do it without even glancing up there. So what we've done here, by this stage, we have completed two of the three sections in the study tonight completed two out of three in this study tonight. Our final task is to identify the place where these people were, first and foremost. The general, the primary geographic location of the events that took place during these leading eras in the Old Testament. So, we're looking for the chief places where all the action happened. And over the page, and there's your missing C, that you'll put in the margin against the nine main locations of the Old Testament, and you'll notice the symbol above there, a couple of mountain peaks. So, we're talking about geography again and locations. Just like the main eras, we had the little hourglass. Time is passing. The figures, the face or the head was against that. Now, the little mountains, the place. So, we've got the era down the left-hand column, then the figure that relates to each era, now the location. So, creation, Adam, or well, we're talking about Eden as the location. Patriarch era, Abraham, well, Canaan. Came from Ur of the Chaldees, but Canaan. Exodus, we have Moses, well, that's all about Egypt. Conquest period, Joshua, they've got out of Egypt, they're into Canaan. Judges, Samson, still in Canaan. Kingdom, David, Israel, another word for Canaan, but because they become a nation here under a monarchy, they're known now as the nation of Israel, but Canaan and Israel are the same place, as you'll note by the key in the map. They're all numbered two here. Then we've got the exile, and Daniel is over there, and he is in Babylon. They come back under Ezra, the key figure, to Jerusalem, because that's what we read about. Not so much the other places in Israel at this time, but it's all focused on Jerusalem. Get the walls up, get the temple rebuilt. Jerusalem is where that happened. And then the silence period with the Pharisees milling around, growing in number and influence, and that is Jerusalem too. So, on the map below, on the page 16, we have nine eras, we have nine figures, and locations. We actually have nine named, but we have only five figures on the map because some of them are the same location, of course. 
So looking over to page 17 and 18, we have the era, creation, figure, Adam, location, Eden. Ah, description, little short description to begin with in these notes. The Garden of Eden, where Adam was created, near the convergence of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, as you can see in the map there, number one, across on the left-hand side, and you'll know that those two rivers were the great rivers of Mesopotamia, Tigris and Euphrates, or Hedekal, as one of them is named in the Bible. Then we have the next era, Patriarch. We've got Abraham there, and he's operating in the land of Canaan. Abraham migrates from Ur near Eden to Canaan, where he and all the other patriarchs live until the time of slavery in Egypt. So, on to three, Exodus, Moses, Egypt is the place. During a severe famine, the Israelites migrate down to Egypt and are enslaved for 400 years before they can walk to freedom. Then we have conquest era. Joshua is the leader. Canaan is the place that they conquer. Joshua leads the conquest of the promised land in Canaan. We're into the judges period after that, and we're still in the land of Canaan. We have Samson. We could have Samuel. We could have Jephthah. We could have a mixture of men in them. Those Israelites, they live in Canaan under a loose tribal system, ruled by judges for the next 450 years. We could put Deborah in there with justification as well, but we've chosen to go and stay with Samson. Kingdom era, that's period number six. David is there. Israel is the place with the formation of a formal monarchy. The land is now referred to by the national name of Israel. So Canaan becomes Israel. Then they're carried away in exile. Daniel is with them to Babylon, Babylonium. Because of judgment for national moral corruption, Israel is conquered by foreign nations, finally forcing her leaders into 70 years of exile in Babylonia. After 70 years, they come back. So there's return. And in that period, main figure, Ezra, Nehemiah too, but Ezra to Jerusalem they go. The exiled Israelites are allowed to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the temple, though they remain under the dominion of Persia. And then the silence period. Pharisees are about. Jerusalem is the main epicenter and hub. Though dominion of the land changes from Persia to Greece to Rome, Israel is allowed to worship in Jerusalem without disruption for the next 400 years that we've termed years of silence. So back we are. Oh, another test here. Here we go. Let me have a mouthful of water and then we'll be ready for this. So test number four. Arc of Bible history. Fill in the names in those eras and, you know, it's going to be such simplicity for you now. You'll have these rattled off. Looking at the little figures in the ark and the way around here, number one, do I hear a creation? Two, patriarch. Three, exodus. Four, conquest. Catch up, dad, there. What's keeping you? Judges will be after that, number five. Kingdom is number six. Number seven is exile. Number eight, return. Number nine, silence. And I'll be this stage. You're probably anything but silent because you're having to write all this so quickly on the way down through. 10, 11, and 12 are New Testament eras. We're not looking at that tonight because we're in the Old Testament timeline. Test number five. We have options here. The options are on the far right column. Using those options, fill in the blanks to match the location to the era that you have on the left and the central figure that you have on the left as well. And I'll let you get on with that. Beginning with Eden, Canaan, Egypt, that's Moses. Joshua, back to Canaan. Samson, still in Canaan. David, it's become a nation, so we're now Israel. Daniel, oh, he's been carried away captive. He's in Babylonia. Ezra, he's one of the ones, the returnees. He's now Jerusalem. And we have the Pharisees, and they're operating out of Jerusalem as well. And then just to crown it out, to maybe bring it all together to show you the movements that went on with God's people through these nine different eras. The map of the final page 20 traces that movement. Look carefully, and you'll get five arrows there. Beginning at Eden, going to Canaan, then Egypt, Canaan, then Babylonia, then back to Jerusalem, and test number six, right below that map, on the map above, number the circles. 
and you've got five circles from one to five to indicate the order of the main movements during the major eras of the Old Testament and then describe these movements below. So, number one came from the direction of Eden, did it not? And they went to Canaan. And that's going to be under number one here when you're writing from Eden to Canaan. Canaan to Egypt, Egypt to Canaan, Canaan to Babylonia, Babylonia to Jerusalem. Those are the answers. You work it out and get the right order and then take a shot of that and send it through to me. You'll have got my email or Facebook or whatever. Send it through. Uh, just as soon as you do it without consultation with anything else in the notes. I'll tell you this, when you master the list that we gave you on page 17 into page 18, when you master those lists of the nine eras, nine figures in the eras, then the nine locations where those figures were operating during those eras, and then have the little short summary as to what happened there. When you master page 17 and 18 and get the chart into your head that's on page 19, that arc there, you are well on the way to understanding the overview of the Old Testament. Now, from tonight on, God willing, We'll be, we've done the broad brush for the past three nights. We'll be going into some more fine detail, but we have laid the foundation, and I hope we've laid a good foundation that we can build upon in future studies, bring it all together, and get the Bible making really good sense to us, that we can get the structure, build the picture, add bits in, it's like putting your jigsaw together, or as the children will be doing now, making their Lego scenarios or Duplo, whatever it is they're on, or a little lad working flat out for me, Joel Hammond, and I got all manner of World War II vehicles and figures from China. There are some good things coming out of China. They came, and he is building 1,000-piece vehicles and 500 and something peace vehicles, and 700 and whatnot peace vehicles. I must show you a picture some of the time. We'll put a few up on our Facebook account and let you see them. But next week, God willing, same place, same time, we'll be looking at the creation era. That's vital, because that takes us to Genesis chapter 1 through to Genesis chapter 11. And let me tell you, every skeptic who has ever walked in two feet wishes Genesis 1 to Genesis 11 had never been written. And then they could have made up the story. Now, they've made up their story in a way. But it's a made-up story, totally fabricated. And that becomes really plain when we go to the foundation of Scripture and see from Genesis 1 to 11 how God is putting in the building blocks for everything that He's ever going to do in our world, including in our day. It's all there, seed form, in Genesis 1 through Genesis 11. Next week, the creation era. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy mercy to us, Thy blessing upon us, for Thy word that has come to us. Be with all of these families that have been bereaved, some in such sudden, tragic circumstances. And Lord, we pray that Thou will come in and answer the cries of Thy people on their behalf. And may they feel tonight and understand tonight a note of a truth. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. In Thy name and to Thy glory we pray. Amen. And now I know what Peter on the organ is going to play. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. <laughs>